more, God. You know, we're not all that. We're really not all that. And truth be told, we're all in a position where we need more of God. I don't care how holy and how sanctimonious you are. Some of us act so holy, we're born with a Bible and a prayer cloth in our hand. Some of you are so holy, even your cologne is Christian Dior. But I don't care how holy you are. In this life, you will face some struggles, and you will face some trials, and find yourself needing more of God. Let me, let me try, to, try to redirect what I'm preaching today. Let's go to Psalm 113. Psalm 113. Psalm 113. I do give honor to God, who's the author and the finisher of my faith. I give honor to my pastor and his absence, Dr. Melvin O'Mariner and Shelley. Let's give him a hand clap of praise, for they are a spiritual gift from God. I try my best to be obedient and not be too long to have us out of here on time. The 113th Psalm. But I do promise I will have y'all home in town for the 11 o'clock news. <laughs> yeah, we'll put you out of here first. Psalm 113. I'm reading the King James Version. To go along with our theme of being thankful for what you have. Being thankful for what you have. If you have it, say amen don't have it is on the screen and if you can't see the screen Pearl Vision opens at 10 o'clock in the morning Psalm 113 it says praise ye the Lord praise O ye servants of the Lord praise the name of the Lord blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore from the rising of the sun until the going down of the same the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high? Who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? He raises up the poor out of the dust and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill that he may set him with princes even with the princes of his people. He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. If I had to choose for a topic, it would simply be, don't keep it to yourself. Give it up for God. Let us pray, God, we thank you. God, we thank you for this day. God, we don't take this day for granted. For it's a day that we've never seen before. And it's surely a day that we'll never see again. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. God, we thank you for your grace. God, we thank you for the songs that have been sung and for the prayers that have been prayed. But we realize now, Lord, that it is preaching time. So I ask now, dear God, I beg you that you would rip me down and tear me apart, that only you would be seen through me. God, please give me an anointing that will make preaching and teaching easy. Anoint my mind that I may think your thoughts. Anoint my ears that I may hear your voice. Anoint my lips that I may speak your words. Anoint my heart that I may feel your presence. Please, God, anoint even now my legs and my feet that I may stand on your promises. And if there's anything now, Lord, that will hinder us from going into higher heights or deeper depths in you, 
I said you said the tomb of Lazarus. Loose the bands and let us go. Now might the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And might those that love the Lord say amen. Amen. Don't keep it to yourself. Give it up for God. One of the most powerful tools that we have and one of the most elaborate opportunities that's afforded to us is the opportunity to be able to praise God. I believe that many of us take advantage of our opportunities to praise God every chance we get because there are times that we refuse to think about how good God has really been to us. There's an old German word, thango, which means to think. So we forget to think because we fail to think. The songwriter stated that when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. I then thank God for saving me. See, church, thinking always precedes thanking. See, if you think about what Jesus did, then you thank him for what he's done. So if you think, then you will thank. If you think about how every morning brings a word of God's faithfulness, then you will thank God for being reliable and dependable in your life. If you think of how his mercies arrive fresh like a hot cup of coffee, then you will thank God for his mercies. When you think of how God has smiled on you every day of your life, then you will thank God for his kindness. I don't think you're thinking. When you think of how his will is our peace, then you will thank God for his peace. When you think of how Jesus stood with you when everybody else ran away from you, then you will thank him for standing by your side. When you think of how he kept you, then you will thank him for his keeping power. When you think of how he led you over the tricks and traps of the enemy, then you will thank him for his divine protection. When you think of how he befriended you when everybody else turned their backs on you, then you will thank him for being a friend that sticks closer than a brother. When you think about the promises he made and the promises he kept, then you will thank him for always keeping his word. I don't think you're thinking. When you think about how others have been blown and battered by the restless sea of time, but in the midst of all, God still gives you rest then you will thank God for his rest. When you think of how he kept trouble away or kept you in trouble or led you around trouble, then you will thank him for being your refuge and your strength. When you think of how he answers your prayers in spite of doubts and fears, you will thank him for coming to see about you. When you think of how he helped you reach unreachable goals and manage unmanageable schedules and overcome unbearable circumstances, deal with difficult people, then you will thank him for his amazing grace. When you think of how he raised you, how he saved you, how he healed you, how he provided for you, how he protected you, how he promoted you, when you think of the goodness of Jesus, then you have no choice but to say thank you. The Bible, the songwriter says, praise ye the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. He told you in one verse to praise God three different times, but he never even gave you a reason. He just says, praise the Lord. See, I want you to understand that we've gotten it twisted in church that praise is not an option, but praise is a command. See, praise is the expression of approval 
or the admiration you have for something or somebody else. See, you praise people, you praise things because of how you admire them. Okay, y'all playing with me. You ever been in a relationship, you know, or had somebody you loved or had a boo, and when you saw them, you admired them? I mean, you either looked at them some kind of way or you said some little gesture or like Bernie Mac, you said, that's nice, real nice. There was something you did to let them know that you admire them. So I guess I'm asking you, how is it we can be so quiet in church? After all God continues to do for us, do you admire God? Do you thank God for what he's done? Do you admire him for who he is? Well, if you do, you ought to give God some praise. But let me help you, let me help you, let me help you. I went to Lakeview Elementary School on Friday. You know, I go often to either read to the kids or I go just to feed the kids, to drop stuff off. So I went on Friday and normally I show up with pizza or subs or, you know, good stuff like that. So whenever I come to the class, there's this one kid named Deshaun. He stands on his chair and he starts clapping whenever I come through the door because he knows I'm bringing him something good. So on Friday, I showed up in my little costume. I had my book to read to the class, but I forgot to pick up some food. When I walked into the classroom with just a book, I said, oh Lord, they're gonna be mad with me. I walked into the class, as soon as Deshaun saw me, he stood in a chair and he started clapping. The girl said, what you clapping for? He ain't got no food. He said, yeah, but I'm thinking about the food he bought last time and how good it was. And if y'all start clapping, he may bring it again. Is there anybody in here that God don't have to do nothing else for you? But when you think of what he's already done, it promotes you to pray. See, it's whenever I begin to praise God. He reminds me of where he's brought me from, where he's brought me to, how he's been keeping me, how he never left me, how he blessed me, how he raised me. That's why I can't come to Grove or any other church and be quiet. I've got to testify. So I praise God, not just for what he's done, but I praise him for the stuff I don't even know about. I praise him for the stuff coming tomorrow. I've learned to praise him in advance. See, church God has been so good, I ain't got time to wait for something to happen. So I praise him for the hell I'm about to go through. I praise him for the trouble that's coming on my job. I praise him for folk that might want to talk about me. I praise him, I ain't got no choice to praise him. I praise God because he's been that good. So I can't speak for you, Grove, but like the psalmist, when I look back over my life, I have no choice but to praise him. So when I wake up, I praise him. When I lay down, I praise him. When I'm driving my car, I praise him. When I'm cleaning my house, I praise him. When I think of where I could have been, I praise him. When I think of where he's brought me through, I praise him. When I think of where he's brought me from, I praise him. I will praise the Lord. He's been that good. I woke up this morning ready to praise. So excuse me if I act cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. But when I think of the goodness of Jesus. Uh, let me calm down. Let me pace myself. Let me, let me pace myself. Let me pace myself. He said, the Lord, Lord, I'm, I'm glad the congressman didn't come today. You think I was crazy. 
the Lord is high above all nations. His glory is above all the heavens. Check this out, verse 5. This makes you shout when you read it. He said, who is like unto the Lord our God? He said, who is like my God? And can I put my point here, church? There ain't nobody like our God. See, our God is so amazing that what confuses man is simple to God. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, there ain't nobody like our God. See, think about it. We serve a God who does strange stuff. We serve a God who takes white seeds, put it in black dirt, and sprout green grass. We serve a God who takes a brown cow with red spots and produce white milk. Just look at what God did in creating you. God took a bunch of dirt and he pieced together 269 bones, 600 muscles, 970 feet of blood vessels. 32 feet of intestine, 32 teeth in your mouths. He gave you a heart that beats some 60 to 80 times a minute on an average of 72 beats per minute. He gave you 400 tiny cups on your tongue so you could pick up the sweets and the sours. He gave you 20,000 tiny hairs in your ear so you can pick up the highs and the lows. Who is like our God? Who put the tart in a lemon? Who put the sweet in an orange? Who put the blue in the sky? Who put the song in a bird? Who put the puff in a cloud? Who put the design in a snowflake? Who put the shape in a woman? The thought in my mind, there's nobody like my God. Come on, church. Who is like your God? Who heals you like God? Uh, who loves you like God? Uh, who keeps you like God? Uh, who comforts you like God? Uh, who provides for you like God? Uh, it could have been you who was shot last night. Uh, it could have been you in the accident. Uh, it could have been your child that didn't make it. Uh, it could have been you that was exposed. But God, there ain't nobody like my God. He said, he said, he said, in verse 7, it really started getting good to me, church. Y'all done about killed me already. Verse 7, he said, he raiseth, oh, God help me. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lift the needy out of the dung hill. And he did it so he can set them up with princes, even with the princes of his people. He said he raised the poor out of the dust and lift the needy out of the dung hill. Now you do know that a dung hill is a hill of manure. A dung hill is the lowest you can possibly go. A dung hill smells nasty, looks nasty. Nobody likes to be around a dung hill but flies. But he says he lifts you out of the dung hill. How many of us have found ourselves in some stinky situations? In some stinky places? With some stinky people? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm glad I don't look like what I used to smell like. Some of us should still smell like depression. Some of us should still smell like abuse. 
Some of us should still smell like prison bars. Some of us should still smell like the crack houses. Some of us should still smell like cheap hotel rooms. But God, don't be discouraged because you find yourself in a bad place because there's a process to being blessed. Blessings don't just come, but there's a process to being blessed. And I hate to burst some of your perfect bubbles, uh, but you can't experience God's glory if you don't have a God story. See, you have to be qualified if you're going to walk around talking about Jesus. See, if you dare to be different and claim Jesus, you've got for, to first be qualified. And see, you ain't been qualified until you've been talked about. You ain't qualified until you've been lied on. You ain't qualified until somebody tried to take what belongs to you. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you can't tell it like I can tell it. What God has done for me. You don't know where he's brought me from. You don't know what he had to take me out of. You don't know what it took to save me. You don't know how he saved my husband, saved my wife. You don't know how he picked me up out of my situation. Until this day, I don't know why God did what he did, but I'm mighty glad that he did it for me. Okay, okay, okay. It's a process. I'm about to break this thing down like a Polaroid picture. It's a process to being blessed. Let me tell you how my grandmama explained the process to me. <clears throat> my grandma, I told you on Sunday mornings, you know, I told y'all Sunday mornings is when I became an addict. Sunday mornings is when I gained about 200 pounds. Because my grandma didn't cook normal breakfast. You know, y'all have bacon and eggs. I had smothered pork chops with gravy and onions, macaroni and cheese, you know, sometimes some collard greens, and some homemade biscuits. Ooh, I miss my grandmama. But whenever she would make biscuits, it was the weirdest looking process. She would take dough, she would ball it up, slam it down, take a rolling pin, and beat it up. Then she would ball it up again, pick it up, slam it down, take a rolling pin, beat it up, and then she'd finally smooth it on out. I said, Grandma, why are you messing up the bread like that? She said, at first, I got to mess it up before I can fix it up. And that's just like our life that sometimes you got to go through some struggles, uh, go through some strains, uh, go through some hard moments, but when God gets ready to smooth you out, he will do what eyes have not seen uh, and ears have not heard. Sometimes you got to go through the process. Well, I ain't got one more thing to say and I'm finished. About one o'clock. Verse nine. Now, I said all of that just to get to verse 9. Now, look at the mastermind that God is. God says, he maketh the barren woman to keep house, comma, and to be a joyful mother of children. That didn't sound too right. He make a woman barren so she can keep house. But he makes a barren woman to be a joyful mother. That don't sound too right. I made her barren, dead, unfruitful unable to multiply, but I did it, comma, to be a joyful mother. <laughs> Wait a minute. I made you barren so you can't have kids, comma, but I made you to be a joyful mother of children. Now, 
Corey, Corey, come help me for a minute. Now, I'm going to use Corey. He, he's my little brother, but I call him my bigger little brother. I don't know why I call him bigger, but he is. He says, I made you barren, unable to reproduce. I made you barren to have to have people talk about you. I made you barren so people can say she's not worth like the other mothers. I made you barren because in order for you to be special during that time as a woman, you had to bear a male child. But I made you barren so you can keep house, comma, and also to be the mother of children. So he says, I made you barren, lifeless, unable to reproduce, unhappy, talked about, discouraged. But don't you know that in this season of being barren, between the season of her being barren and the comma, God turned things around. On this side of the comma, you're going to have to fight a little bit. On this side of the comma, you're going to have to struggle a little bit. On this side of the comma, you're going to be lied on sometimes. On this side of the comma, you may have to lose a house. On this side of the comma, you may have to lose a job. On this side of the comma, you may have lost your marriage, but somehow between here and the comma, God's going to turn that thing around. Is there anybody in here? You're fighting on this side of the comma. You're struggling right now on this side of the comma. But I dare you to not give up, but to keep fighting. Because if you just make it to the comma, God will turn that thing around. And I dare somebody in here who's willing to trust God that much uh, that you know you're fighting uh, on this side of the comma. But I dare somebody, if you trust God and believe God, you take your first step uh, to walk past this comma. Do you need it? Do you want it? Do you trust God? Do you believe God? I dare you, don't stop fighting. Uh, don't stop giving up because between now and the comma, God's going to turn that thing around. Won't God do it? Can't God do it? You believe he'll do it? Shout yes! Shout yes! Shout yes! Shout yes! I know God will give God praise. Give him praise like it's already done. Praise him like it's already happened. Praise him like you've already crossed. Give God praise. about you but if you like me you've been fighting on this side of the comma you've had to fight depression low self-esteem debt bad relationships unhappiness disappointment discouragement but between now and the comma. God has the power to turn your situation around. You know, I felt some of your spirits while I was preaching. You coming to grow was not by happenstance. I don't know you, and I don't know your situation, but you've been struggling, fighting on this side of the comma. But the great thing about God is this. When you establish a relationship with him, 
he plants a comma somewhere in your life. But what happens with most of us is that we give up and we stop fighting before we actually get to the comma. No, God hasn't forgotten about you. God has not left you alone. But there are certain seasons in our life that we have to go through frustration, disappointment, sometimes self-disappointment, self-hurt. It ain't always somebody else doing something to you. Sometimes I had to go through the same thing. Sometimes you have to realize that some stuff you made hard for yourself. See, Christianity is not just a lifestyle. It's a whole bunch of choices and decisions. You know, some of y'all, if y'all like me, you know, you, you just have a hard time sometimes making the right decision. Making the right choice. And you find yourself still on the other side of the common. I'm sorry, I'm just transparent. I, I, you know, my biggest struggles were not before I got saved. Amen, Walls. My biggest struggles were after I decided to follow God. See, my biggest struggles was because, you know, you can easily become comfortable after you get saved. See, when you first get saved, before you get saved, you know, you're struggling. I got to make out to do the right thing. I got to make the right decision. You know, but once you get to know God, for some reason you feel like the hard decision making is is over and then you end up falling prey to old habits to being disobedient and you find yourself just stuck on this side of the comma but God is just that great that he looks beyond your faults and he realized you know what they need me more than they realize so I'm going to extend a little bit more grace until they finally make it to the common so you know I, I, I will say the doors of the church were open the truth is brother and sister those doors never closed Man, Jesus died, and he, when he died and he rose, he opened those doors over 2,000 years ago. He said, whosoever will, let them come. And I'm not talking to a whole group of y'all. It's a couple of y'all I'm talking to right now. I, I feel you. 